Well, today we're in Romans. We're in chapter 15. We're going to look at verses 1 through 7 today. And so let's, uh, let's begin reading together here in Romans at chapter 15, verse 1. And I'll read verses 1 through 4, and we'll get into our study this morning, our studies relating to the strong and the weak. We see that here in this passage, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 7. The Apostle Paul writes, we then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now, as we look at this passage before us, uh, the Apostle Paul is continuing to deal with something related to the subject of what would be called Christian liberty. And sometimes when we think concerning maturity and all, because I want you to note right from the beginning, he speaks of those who are strong, and when he uses the term those who are strong, he's talking about those who are mature in their faith. So sometimes when we think in terms of Christian maturity, we would think of things that that believers do. We can think of spiritual maturity as being revealed by religious activities. Remember that during the time of Christ, there were certain outward things that people would do that others seeing them do this would say, well, they do that because they're religious. Jesus spoke concerning it, especially in the, um, the Gospel of Matthew when he gave the Sermon on the Mount. And he speaks concerning the fact that people would pray and that people would fast and that people would give. Those were the three outward adornments of a religious person during the time of Christ. And yet when Jesus spoke of those three things, they were all outward. Jesus spoke concerning not just their activity, but actually revealed their heart. He said they do these things to be seen by men. And so therefore from men, he said, they shall receive their reward. So for the longest time, people have been caught up thinking that spiritual maturity is really going to be revealed by the things or the activities that we participate in or do. Today, when you speak concerning those things, when you speak about the uh, elements of a mature individual, something that seems to indicate that this person has religious uh, maturity, uh, sometimes we'll speak concerning their, their habits. They, they, they have daily devotions where they get up and read the Bible and and read perhaps a, a book that uh, speaks concerning the life of Christ and how to live for him. So they do daily devotions. Or they believe that somebody is really spiritually mature because they will serve in a church or they're involved in, in more than one Bible study. They go to retreats. They go to conferences. They, they have learned to share their faith with other people. They believe that somebody is spiritually mature based on the fact that they spiritually lead the family or they attend prayer meetings. They, they worship God in song. They're even on time for church. Now, obviously, all of these things reveal hunger, and all of these things reveal spiritual discipline. There's no doubt about it. But the question is, what constitutes true maturity in the body of Christ? You see, the earmark of a mature believer is not just what is done, but the motivation for doing it. And so Paul is writing that the earmark of a mature believer is really the love that that brother has or that sister has for somebody that is a weaker believer, a weaker member of the body of Christ. The spiritually mature are always going to be concerned with encouraging the weaker believers. And that concern is revealed by a desire not to cause them to stumble in their faith. And that's what Paul has been speaking about. Paul often alludes to that. He's been speaking about it here in the book of Romans. In chapter 13, for example, at verse 10, Paul had already said, love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. In chapter 14, verse 19, he said, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. So he's been speaking concerning this, not only in Romans, but in other books he's written. Philippians 2, verse 4, he said, let each, let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interests of others. So when you truly love somebody, you begin to be concerned about how you affect them. Now, there are many people who understand that, many parents, including those who don't have a faith relationship with Christ, many parents learn this as they raise their own children. 
Before they had children, there were certain things that was normal for them, things that they did, things that they said. But when they begin having their children, sometimes they no longer have a freedom or feel a freedom to do those things that at one time they did without any concern for anybody else. And so they have their children and they begin to watch their language when they're around their kids. And they begin to monitor their, their reading habits and their radio and their TV habits. They begin to change the way that they dress and, and where they dress. And, and they're careful about what movies they take the kids to. They begin to limit their drinking. They stop smoking. In general, they're careful to set a good example. And they do that because they know that these young children, their young children, are watching them. And so there are many people who change their behavior based on how they affect others and how they influence others. And they do this not because they do not feel free to do this any longer, but they do this kind of thing. They voluntarily restrict their behavior because they don't want to harm their children. They limit their behavior based on the tenderness and vulnerability of the child that they love so much, and they restrict their behavior because they love somebody else. So people do that all the time. It's just part of being a, a human being. There are things that you are no longer doing because you know it's going to affect somebody else. Paul has been speaking about this, and he's been speaking in the context of what is proper to eat and what is proper to drink. And that, that has been part of the controversy he's been dealing with, especially in chapter 14, which, which actually continues on into chapter 15. And so he's saying what we ought to do is we ought to do even as the Lord has done. God has received the weaker one, and so should we. It said that in chapter 14, verse 4. So Paul is continuing his teaching here in Romans chapter 15, verse 1, when he says, we then who are strong ought to to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. So he's continuing really what he had begun in chapter 14, and he's saying that what we are to do is love one another. The real gauge of a Christian and his maturity isn't the things that he or she feels free to do, it's the love that they have for those who are weaker in their faith. So notice how he says, we who are strong ought to bear with the weaker brother, in other words, his convictions, his scruples. That word scruple isn't a word that normally we use in everyday life. It, it speaks concerning weaknesses, but the word scruple speaks of qualms or moral reservations. It speaks of the uneasiness someone can have concerning the propriety of something, whether or not it's a proper thing to do. It speaks of moral reservations. And so he says, we who are strong or mature ought to bear with the scruples, the moral reservations of the immature in the faith and not to please ourselves. So that's how he begins. Now, when he says ought, we who are strong ought, that word ought is not a suggestion. It's not like he's saying, well, we ought to go here or we ought to do this. The word is stronger than that. The word ought is not a suggestion. It's a command. He's saying the mature are to help the weak and not stumble them. That is not a suggestion. He is speaking to those who are reading this even to this day. He is speaking to those who are spiritually mature. And he's saying, this is a command to you. You are not to stumble those who are weak in their faith. You're to help them. Now, he says you are to bear with the scruples of the weak. When he says you are to bear, that word bear is not speaking of bearing up or bearing with, rather, or putting up with somebody. I mean, sometimes we have to bear with other people simply because we work with them or we live with them. You know, maybe they're a roommate or something, and you have to bear with them. And, and we use that phrase, man, I have to bear with that guy or... I have to bear with that person I'm working with. And that's not what he's saying here. The word bear is not putting up with. The word bear here is speaking about holding up. It, it, it speaks of the strong carrying the load, helping somebody else. It's a word that he uses in various places, including Galatians 6, verse 2, where he said, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. We're to strengthen the person. We're supposed to carry the load along with them, not bring them down is what he's saying. So if I'm really mature in the faith of Christ, I'm going to bear the load with a weaker brother or sister. So a genuinely mature Christian isn't going to judge them, and it's certainly not going to cause them to stumble. Now, he says in verse 2, let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. The word edification means to be built up or strengthening. So let us please his neighbor for his good. So don't strive, in other words, to please yourself. Die to your own opinions. The refusal to live a life of self-pleasing 
is the earmark of being mature. And it reveals that you actually love the Lord and love others. It's a willing adjustment to whatever contributes to the spiritual good of somebody else. It's like what he said to the Corinthians when he said, let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. So when we live like we're the only person on earth, we're in danger of wounding someone else. And when we use our freedoms to live for ourselves, it's interesting, but not only do we wound others, but we also sin against the Lord. In 1 Corinthians 8, 12, Paul said, when you thus sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. And so the believer who is actually mature is somebody who bears the burdens of somebody else and cares for them, is especially concerned for their spiritual growth and for their spiritual well-being, and therefore isn't going to stumble them, and certainly in the stumbling is not going to be sinning against Jesus Christ. Now, why would I do that? Well, notice verse 3. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. Now, that's pretty strong if you think about it for a moment. Even Christ himself did not please himself. Jesus did not live to please himself. So Jesus is the supreme example. He did not come to please himself, but rather to please his Father. In John 8, 29, he said, He who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. And so why would I care about stumbling somebody else? And indeed, people do get stumbled by my behavior. I understand that. And they get stumbled by every believer. Every one of us has an opportunity and propensity to, to cause somebody else to stumble by the freedoms that we exercise and all. Why would I care? Well, he says, because Christ didn't please himself. And if I'm becoming like Christ, being conformed into the image of Jesus Christ, if Jesus did not please himself, but rather was pleasing to his father, then it stands to reason that a believer ought to live a life in such a way as to bring pleasure to God, to do, do those things that are pleasing to him. Jesus himself did not please himself. He wasn't all about himself. He didn't use his authority and exercise it in such a way as to not care about other people. And so, yes, of course, as a believer, I want to make sure that I do not stumble somebody else. It's interesting that sometimes when I've been, well, Marie has been in, in uh, in a Costco or someplace, you know, one of those large stores. And, but it's not just Costco. She's mentioned it from Costco, but other places that sometimes we run across people. We together have, and she on her own has. We run across people from our church. And it's, I, I always enjoy that, by the way. I was just talking to somebody just the other day who said that they feel awkward coming up and saying hello. And I, and I always say the same thing. No, I, I, I like it. I appreciate it when you come and if I'm eating my meal, I love it when you pay for the meal. So no, please come. <laughs> please, you're all welcome all the time. But Marie and I have been in, in stores, and Marie has been on her own in this one. When, when somebody has walked up and they'll say, hello, Marie, I go to your church, and it's nice to see you. And Marie laughs because she says, and then there have been times that they'll look down to see what I'm buying. <laughs> you know, looking for wine, I guess. I don't know. You know, and we're aware of that. We're aware of the fact that the freedoms Christ can give to us are not to be exercised in such a way as to cause anybody to stumble. I mean, that's what love is, isn't it? And there are things that you voluntarily would put aside even if you felt the freedom to do it if it causes somebody else to stumble. That's maturity. And when we get caught up saying, no, I have my rights, I can do the things that I want to do, and it's your problem how you respond to that. You've got to grow up. I'm not exercising love. What I'm doing is stumbling a weaker brother or sister, and it's just not right. And that's what Paul is speaking about here. Jesus himself did not please himself. And what's interesting is there's a price to pay. Because he says in verse 3, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. There is actually a price to pay for that kind of life. And part of the price to pay is being misunderstood. And sometimes even being abused. But Jesus' submission ultimately led to his death. And our submission is death to self. Now, as Paul is speaking about this, it's interesting how he brings in verse 4. He says in Romans 15, 4, for whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. What 
is he speaking about here? Well, the scripture, the Bible, is for us. God has given to us his word that he might guide us, strengthen us, instruct us, bless us, encourage us, warn us, and give us hope. God's word is intended to do that. And that's the reason why we look at the stories of Scripture and we learn from them. That's why we spend time in the Bible. That's why we read it. The Scripture itself, speaking of itself, in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says this, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Bible has a purpose to equip us so that we might perform those things that are pleasing to God. Jesus himself did not please himself. The believer is not intended to just live for our own self-pleasure. And the word of God is that which instructs us in order that we might know what is pleasing to God and live in such a way that God will bless us. If there's anything that I want to encourage all of us today in, it is to understand our need for God's word. To understand that it is something that actually guides, directs, blesses, warns, encourages, gives us hope. Before I got saved, if you would have spoken to me as a 20-year-old man, and you would have said to me, what do you think about certain issues? I'd have given the, the uh, answer that many people give today. If you'd have said to me, what do you think about um, abortion? Abortion, the issue of abortion was really big when I was growing up. And when in the, in the 60s and 70s, it became a huge issue. And so there were arguments that were going on during that time. I remember Jesse Jackson, who was anti-abortion at that time, saying that uh, it was actually genocide, that it's the destruction of a race because so many African Americans were receiving abortions or would have been in line to receive an abortion that he basically said it is wrong because you're trying to destroy an entire race of people. He was opposed to it in the 70s, and many people were in the early 70s. But if you'd asked me, what do you think about that issue? I would have said something like, it doesn't matter to me either way. What people do with their own body, I'd have said that. It's fine. They have to make the choices. They have to live with those choices. I don't really care either way. And I might have made a joke or two about it. If you'd asked me concerning homosexuality, I'd have said, listen, that's not my thing. I'm not into that at all. But at the same time, who am I to say something about somebody who wants to live a life like that? And I would have said, it doesn't really matter to me either way. It's not harming anybody, etc." And that would have been my line of reasoning. And I wouldn't have had a problem with that. If you'd have said to me, what about legalization of marijuana? I'd say, yeah. <laughs> I'd say, right on. Of course. I mean, what's the big deal, man? And I used to argue that. And I would say that. I'd say, listen, I mean, you say I shouldn't smoke pot, but you go and you buy your scotch. You know, so you like to drink because that's legal, but you tell me I can't smoke a joint because it's not. And I said, we're going for the same purpose. I said, and yet, uh, and I would tell them, and yet, and yet you're telling me I can't smoke pot, but you can, you can drink all you want. Why? Because you're 21? And I would argue that, and, and a lot of us to this day, uh, you know, might even argue that even now. The thing is, is that I don't feel those ways that way anymore. A lot of people get their opinions in life from what they watch on TV or what they listen to on the radio. Or a magazine, perhaps, that they pick up and read in an airport or when they're in a doctor's office or that they subscribe to. Or they get their opinions from the classes that they take in high school or college or what somebody else they respect says. Maybe occasionally they'll watch something on the news, but most people don't watch the news. It's not one of the highest rated thing, a rated thing amongst the youth. I mean, if you speak to somebody 18 to 35 and ask them, where do you get your opinions from? You know, very often you might find this interesting, but if you begin to pry and ask, which I've done, uh, where do you get your ideas about? Do you watch news? No, no. 
I wonder how many people in here actually watch the news every day. Most don't. Not everybody does. A lot do, but not, not everybody. Most don't. Do you watch this particular program? Do you watch this particular channel? What do you watch? Well, you know, I don't know. I don't really care about it. I'll just pick it up through common conversations. And so we don't really formulate our opinions based on study or, or investigation. And most of the people who are younger today get much of their opinion from the, com the comedies in late night uh, shows, you know, uh, the, with the Lettermans and the Lenos and the Jimmy Kimmels and, 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 and other shows like Bill Maher. And, and they, they listen to these commentators who are basically more of them are comedian than anything. They're just trying to make people laugh, though they, they may adhere to those beliefs themselves. But through humor, they can actually denigrate somebody else. And they use humor to undermine all kinds of arguments. And they undermine e even political parties. That's what they do. And that's what happens. And so a lot of people get their political opinions by whether or not that guy is handsome or not. And therefore, I'll vote for him because he's cool. And they don't think about policies. They don't think in terms of what's going to happen if these policies are actually enacted, you see. And that's what happens. And so we're not thinking through. And if you would have asked me when I was 20 years old before I got saved if these certain issues mattered, I'd have said to you, doesn't matter to me at all. It doesn't affect me. It's not hurting me if it doesn't hurt me. And that's because it was about me. But when I got saved, I started reading the Bible. And it was at the age of 20 that I began to read the Bible. And as I began to read the Bible, I began to formulate well-thought-out opinions related to those subjects. Is it right for a man to marry another man? The Bible says it's an abomination before the Lord. Why? It destroys the fabric of society and destroys families. You cannot take and redefine family for your convenience. So no, that's not right. Where did I get that idea from? From Scripture. Is it right to take the life of an unborn child? Well. The argument is it's, it's a woman has a right to her own body, but that child is not her body. That child has a body of its own. So do you have a right to take the life of a living person? Well, they're not really a person, or really, when they part the womb, what do they become? Are you telling me that it's a whale until it's born and it becomes a human? It doesn't make any sense. And when you start to think things through, by the way, God says we are fearfully and wonderfully made, the Bible says that John the Baptist leapt in the womb of his mother when he heard the voice of Mary. That tells me that's a living, sentient human being, maybe not fully developed, but it is certainly a human being there showing honor to the God of, 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 of the universe. Come on now. So that, where did I get that idea from? Somebody says, you're so backwards. Well, no. I got that from Scripture. Is it right for me to smoke pot and get drunk and loaded? All? No, why? Well, because... The Bible speaks of drugs in this way. It's called pharmakeia. Pharmakeia is also a word that is translated sorcery. Sorcery is found in Galatians 5, 19 through 22. It is regarded as a work of the flesh, and those who are in, involved in this kind of thing, who are recreationally using drugs, are called sorcerers in Scripture. It's not right because it's a work of the flesh, and that means that I'm not having a relationship with God. And I can go on and on and on about the things that I at one time approved that now I say, no, it's not right. And it didn't come because I was watching Jimmy Kimmel. It came because through the Scriptures, these things were written for me so that there would be an impact in my life. And that's why you read the Bible. That's why I encourage you to be more than Sunday Christians. That's why I encourage you to read your Bible every day. Every day. Why would you want to do that? Well, my soul faints for your salvation, but I hope in your word. Psalm 119, 81. Great peace have those who love your law, and nothing causes them to stumble. Psalm 119, 165. You see, the stories, the accounts that we find in Scripture build up our faith. It's like what it says in the book of James 5.11 where it says, Indeed, we count them blessed to endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. If you only see the first portion of the life of Job, you would think anything but the Lord being compassionate and merciful. How many times have we gone through a trial and we're in the midst of it and we're thinking anything but that God is good? You're going through the trial, and you may, like Jeremiah, want to say to the Lord, I want to speak to you concerning your judgments. I'd like to have a discussion with you, Lord, because this is not fair. This is not right. Look at the pain I'm going through. Look at the hurt. I'm suffering. I don't understand the cause of it, and I don't understand why you're not relieving me from it. And you go through it, and you think to yourself, as you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, 
You're thinking to yourself, I'm going to die in the midst of the valley. I'm not going to make it through. I had a young lady who spoke to me once, and she said, Pastor, you know, pray for me. I'm going through such a long trial. I said, you're going through a trial? And she said, yes. It's so long. And I said, oh, really? She says, it's been three weeks. I said, you're not married, are you? You don't have any children, do you? Trials lasting three weeks? Don't we understand that sometimes a trial will last an entire lifetime? Am I talking to myself? Sometimes trials can last a lifetime. You wake up in the morning and say, oh, am I going to make it through the day? And God says, no, you want me to kill you today? Yes, please, Jesus. Please. Some things last a lifetime. But guess what happens in that lifetime? You become more like Christ. You grow, you're strengthened, you're purified. You become a woman or a man of God. And you will not regret going through that trial. Why? Because we see the end of Job, that God was compassionate and Job was blessed. That story edifies me. It strengthens me. You have seen the, ed, the end of Job. How compassionate God is. How merciful God is. Did Job think God was that way as he was going through that? No. Job cried out to the Lord many times. He said, oh, I only wish I could speak to him about this. I would ask him, why me? But at the end, Job simply says, I will put my hand over my mouth. I have spoken without reason. I shouldn't have said anything. I abhor myself in dust, sackcloth, ashes. God blessed Job, and God will bless you. You may be crying out for somebody that you love, a husband, a wife, a child, a parent, and you may pray every day saying, God, please, please save them. And it seems that God is silent to you, and you die never seen the joy of them coming to faith in Christ. And at your funeral, they come to faith in the Lord. I've seen that in funerals where a mother's prayer has been answered by a daughter, son, coming to faith in Christ at their funeral. They finally just gave up and said, my mom's in heaven and I want to be with her. I need to get right with God. Mama did not see it on the face of the earth, but she rejoices in heaven when her baby comes home. And she sees there, that baby in heaven with her. Guys, hold on. But how are you going to hold on if you don't know Scripture? How are you going to judge what is right and what is wrong if you don't know the Bible? So he says, the Scriptures were given. Whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. He goes on to say in verse 5, now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore receive one another just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. And so he says to us, may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded. The God of patience and comfort. How long, O oh Lord, how long? When are you going to come back? Look how earth is, Jesus. People have been praying for Jesus to return for a long time. But I have to tell you this. I'm glad in a way that he didn't return before I got saved. God has patience. He waits till that last one comes in. He has patience, and so should we. And literally what he is saying is, may God, who gave them the patience and comfort that supported them in all their trials, grant them the same power to do that for others, like Jesus had done for them. Have patience with one another because God has had patience with you. You who are strong and get so frustrated sometimes with the scruples of the weak, have patience with them. Love them, encourage them that they might grow in faith. 
not so that it sets you free to do the things that you long to do, but so that they might grow up in their faith in Christ and become spiritually strong. He wants us, according to verse 6, to be of one mind and one mouth, that we might glorify the God and Father of the Lord Jesus. You know, believers do grow spiritually at different rates. They have different degrees of maturity. We know that. So we need to consider where other people are in their spiritual maturity. And having unity encourages us to live as the body of Christ, and therefore we don't divide ourselves. What we need to do is we need to have the desire that the Lord has, and that is for the unity in the body of Christ. That's been a pattern in the early church. You see this in the book of Acts, for example, in chapter 4, verse 32, where it says, The multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. They were of one heart and one soul. Philippians 2, 1 and 2 says, If there is any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let us be in unity. Let us have one heart. What is the church supposed to do? The church is supposed to love one another. And that's why he says in verse 7, receive one another, just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. The word receive means to accept. Don't try and change people to agree with you. Accept them. Jesus received us to the glory of God. So we should receive one another. Luke tells us how all the tax collectors and sinners drew near to him to hear him. The Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, the man receives sinners and he eats with them. He still does. He still receives us. He still encourages us to live for him. And he's still encouraging us to receive one another. Welcome one another, love one another, encourage one another, accept one another. And let God do his work in one another. I'm not one of these guys who wants to go around changing you. I have to be honest with you. In my early days of walking with the Lord, I most definitely did. Most definitely. I would see a, a believer doing something dumb. And the first thing I wanted to do was walk up to him and say, Hey, don't you understand? You're not supposed to do that anymore. It only took a few failures on my part for me to realize that I need the grace that I, I need grace that I should be giving to other people because I of all people need the grace of God in my life. And I began to learn to accept. He used to try to change people. I remember when Marie and I were dating I took off for three months to Europe, backpacked. And I was gone for three months, but I would send her letters. And in the letters, I would say to her, look, Marie, I want you to memorize these scriptures. Romans chapter 3, verse 10. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. John 3, 16. John 5, 24. Uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. And uh, when I come home, I want you to repeat them to me. <laughs> Serious, I'm kidding. True. I got home from Europe and I went to see her and I'm sitting there at her dining table at her apartment and I say, okay, Marie, Romans 3.10, what does it say? She goes, well, it says something about, I said, what's it say? Okay, how about Romans 3.23? What is Romans? Uh, it, it says something like, ah, okay, how about Hebrews 9, 27? Oh, I knew it, I knew it. She, she gets all upset. So, you know, the comforting, loving man that I am, I say to her, what have you been doing for three months? <laughs> I mean, I've been gone for three months. It's not that much. I only gave you nine scriptures. She gets up from the table and she rushes to her room and she sits down on the edge of her bed. And I look at her roommate and I say to her, what's up? What's wrong with her? David, she has tried so hard to memorize those scriptures. She just gets tongue-tied. And I walked into her room to comfort her, and I sat next to her, and I said, what's wrong with you? Why are you so upset? 
I've tried so hard. And she's crying. She's seated there crying. And I'm looking at her with like, like I'm, a, I'm just like, I'm as dumb as a rock. I'm just looking at her going, I don't get it. Look at, these are not hard. So appointed unto men to die once after this, the judgment. Duh. God so loved the world that he, and I'm quoting the scriptures and I'm saying, why didn't you learn those things? I was 25 years old. And the Holy Spirit put a word in my heart I've never forgotten. He said, she's not you. She's not you. She's Marie. She is not you. The Holy Spirit, at that point, we weren't even married yet, said, you stop trying to create her in your image. She's supposed to be in the image of Christ, not you. Well, guess what? Receive one another. Receive one another. Because that person that you may have problems with right now, love them, tell them the truth when God gives you ability, but love them for the kingdom of God's sake. I had a guy I used to disciple. who lived, I used to live just up the street before I got married. His name was Steve. Steve had an alcohol problem, but I led him to faith in Christ. Steve used to bring home two cases of beer and drink them over the weekend himself. He was just a guy who had, had, he had beer all the time. He was an alcoholic, and he was only like 21 years old. He was already a confirmed alcoholic. And that man drank. I mean, every time you see him, he had a beer. And he was just drinking constantly. He was an alcoholic. But he came to a Tuesday night Bible study I was doing here in, in uh, Chino. And he got saved. And I was rooming there. And uh, one day I walked up to him. And he said, you've got to stop that. And I said, stop what? He said, David, let me tell you something. He said, when I walk in the house, he says, I notice that you walk up to me and you get real close to me to smell my breath to see whether there's alcohol on it. I said, what? He says, David, that's what you've been doing. He says, you stand next to me and, you, and you're smelling to see if there's beer on my breath. And I'm not drinking anymore, I got saved. He goes, you loved me more before I got saved than you do now that I am saved. I've never forgotten that either. He's right. I was narking him, I was there right. I did not trust the Lord to do the work that God said he would. He who has begun a work in you will continue until the day of Christ Jesus didn't come to my mind. I was the Holy Spirit. I was going to form him into the image of Christ. And Steve said, no, you're not. No, you're not. Receive one another. God is able to make him to stand. Paul's already said in Romans 14, 4, who are you to judge another man's servant? To his own master, he either stands or falls. God is able to make him to stand, right? Love one another. I'm not saying, let's just say, oh, they're in lots of sin, we'll just ignore it. No, there are times when you have to, with love, bring a correction. But love the person. Hate the sin, but love the person. Because Jesus died for him. I hate the sin. It put my Savior on the cross. He was tortured for my sin. I cannot love what he died to set me free from, but I can love the person that he died for, and I want them to know Jesus Christ. Receive one another. Receive one another. Accept one another. And in doing so, you'll bring honor to Christ.